to our next two speakers who will be having a conversation about the role of innovation and technology in empowering girls. And so it is truly my honor to introduce our next two speakers because one of them also uh, will be our first youth speaker which is super, super exciting. And so do stay tuned throughout the day. We have a number of youth speakers joining us. Um, and that is something I'm super, super proud of. I think the youth voice is particularly amazing and important in our world today. And I would encourage you actually, um, if you're able to donate to the Collateral Repair Project, which is an NGO I'm working with and I'm in Jordan, um, as they are trying to empower as many youth voices as possible and reintegrate young refugee girls into school systems in Jordan. And so please do donate and get ready for um, Fatima Al-Kabi and Dr. Rana al Kalyubi, otherwise known as my mom. I'm super, super excited to listen into their conversation about technology and innovation, which is totally out of my kind of wheelhouse, but I am super, super excited because I know they have a lot to offer um, about girls' education, so enjoy. Thank you, Jenna. Hi, Fatima. Hi, Dr. Serena. Um, all right, so first of all, I, I will uh, just introduce myself very quickly. I have to say I am here today in the capacity of uh, uh, being Jana's mom, and I'm, I'm so, so proud. Um, and I also can't believe that she's 17, like what? <laughs> um, but when I'm not Jana and Adam's mom, I am the co-founder and CEO of Affectiva. We are an AI company based in Boston, and uh, we do all sorts of really cool research. I'm also the author of a new book, Girl Decoded. Um, but I'm not here to talk about myself. I, I, uh, Jenna and I had agreed that I wasn't really going to have a role in, in this event until she found you, Fatima. And I was like, can you please make me interview her? So I'm, I'm here to interview Fatima. Um, for those of you actually who don't know my story, I grew up in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the Middle East. I'm, of course, Egyptian. Uh, but my parents lived both in Kuwait. And I went to school in Abu Dhabi as well. Fatima grew up in Al Ain, which is uh, the government that's right next to uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, so we share that. We share that in mm -hmm. common. Um, but also, she was crowned as UAE's youngest inventor. She started innovating at the young age of seven, which is amazing. And at 15, she garnered all sorts of awards. Um, Many awards for her achievements. So she was the uh, she had she won the Abu Dhabi Award in 2018. You were the winner of the UAE Robot Olympics in 2014, um, and many 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 uh, kind of awards, Arab awards, uh, for being the best top ten inventor and best top innovator. And the Sheikh Fatima um, bin Mubarak's International Award for Arab Youth in 2017. You know. As I was kind of prepping for this conversation, Fatima, what struck me is that you aren't the youngest woman or girl inventor in the UAE and, and kind of in the Arab world. You're just the youngest. And I just think that that is really awesomely cool. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome to the conversation. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And thank you for joining us. The pleasure is mine. I'm very honored to be part of this conversation with you. and. I just want to take a minute to say happy birthday to Jenna, and I'm very happy that you chose me to be part of this incredible event. Thank you. So why don't we start about you just telling us about yourself, um, your, your upbringing, and kind of what got you interested in all of this? So as you mentioned, my name is Fatma Kabi. Uh, I'm 18 years old. I'm currently a rising sophomore studying computer engineering at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm originally from Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. Um, I've, so far, I've created 12 inventions that tackle different problems around my community. And also, as you mentioned, I started at the age of seven, but my first invention um, came out at the age of 10 after I got some experience building stuff with my parents uh, being around. Um, both of my parents are engineers, so I was very inspired by being around them. But also, I found something that I was, I was really passionate in and... Luckily, I was able to create different things that helped me and helped the community around me. So this is something we also have, the two of us have in common too. So both my parents are technologists as well. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a house where we always interacted with the latest gadgets and, and, and I just didn't have a fear of technology. So I want you to take us back to your seven-year-old, your creative, inventive seven-year-old. What did that look like? What, what were you doing? Like, what were you, how were you practicing being creative and inventive? 
So looking back at my childhood, this is something I realized later that like even the cartoons I like to watch on TV or the TV shows were very tech oriented. Like I like to watch the show, how it's made, where they show you like the whole process of making something in the factory or like Dexter's lab where you have Dexter building different things in, in his lab and all these different shows that were inspiring somehow and shaped my personality. But also, as you mentioned, like I, I also have that similar experience of going out around different gadgets and new things. So I wasn't really scared because I heard my parents talk about their work all the time and I was curious to do it myself. So mm -hmm. at the beginning, I was really interested in learning about new things. And my parents started introducing me to like these small kits that come with instructions and little pieces with like motors and a few parts to build like small robots or things like that. And then I think they got me free into this field and sometimes my parents say that I'm taking over their work. So <laughs> um, yeah, it's something that I'm passionate about. I'm actually curious, do you have any siblings? I do, I have three younger sisters, we're four girls. Oh, oh that's so cool. Are they mm -hmm. also in STEM, interested in STEM and technology and or um, different interests? Yeah. Not really. Everyone's interested in their own thing. I think my parents are happy I'm following their legacy. <laughs> <laughs> so they can check that box. I, well, yeah. I have two younger sisters, not three, but I have two younger sisters. So we also grew up in a, a very predominantly, you know, girls household, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like my parents, your parents are also very pro-education and, and, and kind of send this message that girls can do anything they want, which... Um, you know, it's 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 a little and not an, I don't want to say it's unusual because that would not be true. Mm -hmm. um, there is this misconception, I think, about the Middle East that, um, you know, education really doesn't matter for girls. And I, I just want to hear kind of your perspective on that. Like what what was the message your parents sent to you and your sisters? And um, yeah, and, and kind of the importance of education in your life. Um, so I'm very privileged that I grew up in a household and in a country that encourages women to pursue education, either high school or even higher education, you know, a master's or PhD. Um, so I think that's a privilege at the beginning. And also, my parents are big supporters of me and my sisters. Um, they're always encouraging us to do our best and to find what we're passionate about. So I owe so much of what I am today to them. Um, but also to the environment that I grew up in, I didn't realize that I am very privileged until I left the UAE to complete my studies in the States and realized that my experience is not everyone's experience. And the way people look at me is very different because they think, you know, I come from the Middle East, I maybe I'm not educated. So they're very surprised that I'm there to study, you know, the same course they're studying and in the same college. Um, so I have to acknowledge the privilege that I have and also the great opportunities that I got. That's awesome. We'll come back to that topic. But first, tell me about your very first invention. What was that? <laughs> so my first invention came out in 2010 and it was a photographer robot that I accidentally built. I wanted to build something for a conference that I was joining in Dubai and I wanted something that would make my booth stand out. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted everyone to come and see this new thing I'm obsessed with. Um, so I thought, okay, let me build a robot that took Polaroid pictures of people who were attending the conference. And then suddenly I became an inventor and people were coming over to see this new thing they've never seen before. Um, but I think the, the thing that inspired it in the first place is because I wanted to take pictures with my friends and selfies didn't exist at the time. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why not build something to solve that problem? But I think now that selfies exist, no one wants my robot anymore. <laughs> I, I think there's I think there's a case to be made for a really awesome social robot that can roam around and take pictures. I, I think there's a business opportunity there. I love how it started with a pain point that you wanted to solve. That's usually kind of where it all begins, right? Uh, 
Uh, we lost you a little bit, Fat Fatma, and I, I don't know if it, that's me or you. So I think we might have lost Fatima's um, internet connection for a few minutes. So hopefully she'll be back soon. But I was really, really interested to hear in your conversation about how you in particular, Mommy, have used um, technology to advocate for empowering girls globally. Yeah, so, um, so um, oh, I think Fatma might be back. I think you're back. Yay, we have you back. Uh, I'm, I'm hey. glad to be back. <laughs> uh, can you hear me good now? We can. The problem is it's really windy outside, so that made the problem. That might be the problem, but yeah. Um, you're back. So you were telling us about. Uh, I, I was asking you how um, an invention usually starts by solving a pain point. So um, I think I answered the whole question, but to my own. <laughs> so what I was saying is at the beginning, it was more of wanting to benefit myself and having fun just as a kid. But then later I realized that I have a role in my community and I need to use the talent that I have to help the people around me. So usually I try to pinpoint an issue around or a problem that I could help um, solve using some form of technology. And again, I'm very lucky to have these skill sets that able me to build different things that could help people. So tell us about some of your most impactful inventions. What have you been focusing on? Um, so I've created 12 inventions and I always say they're all like my kids. It's really hard to pick my favorites, but I also have a few that I think are the ones that I'm most proud of just because of the level of advancement that they have and the technology that they have, because comparing an invention that I made at the age of 10 is of course very different than something I made at the age of 17, for example. Um, so the latest, latest invention that I made is called the teleporter robot, which is a robot that attends school instead of sick children. So what I aimed to do was to recycle hoverboards um, that were around my house, uh, me and my sisters own a few. And I created a recycled version of this like teleparents type of technology. Uh, for kids to use when they can't attend school. But initially it was created for me because I skipped school a lot for conferences and I still wanted to be in class. So I created something like that and thought maybe kids with terminal disease, diseases or thing, or like long appointments and things like that could use it. That's wonderful. So that is amazing. That's, yeah, that's an incredible use case. Mm -hmm. and, and actually I'm thinking now in the times of this pandemic where, um, it, you, you know, you have sick people in hospitals and you can't visit them as a family member and, and, and maybe there's an opportunity to use your robot um, to connect people. Have you thought of that? So I didn't until I did an interview a few weeks ago and someone mentioned it and I was like, oh, maybe I should focus on making more of these for the more like at the moment. But yeah, you could use the technology for so many things, but I focused on uh, customizing it, especially for students and being able to interact with other students. Are there any other inventions that you have um, kind of revised or iterated on in light of uh, the global pandemic? Um, so I had a very long time with nothing to do here at home. And I thought, why not create something to help my family and help myself? Uh, so I created a disinfecting gate. Um, that we assembled on our door outside. Um, it's more of an innovation, just using a bunch of stuff that I found around my house uh, to create something. Um, and I was able to create something for less than about $100, which is very cheap compared to the gates that you would find in the market today that cost more than $5,000. Um, so this is something that I've uh, created recently just to help the people around me and you know use my time for something useful. That is amazing. I mean, I, I, I imagine there's a lot of, again, commercial opportunities of, of, of that. And I love how you are inventing by just using stuff that's around you, right? Like that, that's really cool. So let's talk about that. Like, what does the process of invention look like? Uh, so usually for this in innovation, I didn't focus on following that uh, template of like steps that I usually do because having access to different things is very difficult, but 
usually I would come up with the idea, talk to my parents about it, see what they think about it. You know, it's taking an adult's perspective, but also doing some research, asking the people who could benefit from it, what they need, what they specifically don't have with the current solutions, and then creating a couple of prototypes until I'm happy with what I have. Yeah, I think I, I think what I love about your approach, which has been true for me as well, is the importance of building something, right? You can because you can ideate and you can think about ideas all you want, but until you reduce it to practice, that's when it really kind of becomes real and people can react to it. They can say, "Oh my God, I love your disinfectant gate," or like, mm, mm. "How about you change it in that way a little bit?" So, mm. um, what about the role of failure? Have, have, have any of your inventions, like, yeah, have you failed at all, ever? Um, yes, of course. I've always had a fear from failure just because I have high expectations for myself. But also, um, you know, taking my inventions to, like, science fairs uh, locally or internationally and not getting, like, a medal or something like that really hit me hard. But then I realized it's not about the recognition. It's more about the impact that I'm doing with these things. Because before it's like, oh, I seek people's approval, but now it's more of like, okay, if the community is benefiting from what I did, I don't need the trophy or I don't need the recognition um, to realize that what I did is worth celebrating and worth using by the community that could actually benefit from it. Yeah, that's amazing. The, the impact on the community comes first, right? Yes. Um, I want to I wanna just give a shout out to everybody who is tuned in and watching us and listening to us. If you have questions for Fatma, let me know. I will make sure to, um, to ask those. Um, so, you know, you talked about the impact of community and, um, and I believe just by being you and the, the work you're doing, you must be an incredible role model for other young girls. So, is that how you see yourself and, and what role do you think you play? I mean, I think a role model is a very big title. And sometimes when people call me that, I feel like it's a, you know, more pressure or a bigger responsibility. And I, I really understand how big of a role I do play in my community. But also, I think I'm more of a representation to what you could be if you were interested in innovation, because growing up, I didn't see any women in tech that I could look up to. And I think the reason I have an Instagram page or I post things on social media is because I want other girls to look at my page and think, okay, if she can do it, I can do even better. And I think that's that's what I see myself, more of a representation and hopefully an inspiration for other people. You're definitely a role model. You're just being humble, but, but it's <laughs> like, there are young girls watching you and thinking, oh my God, if she can do it, I can too. And I think that's very, very powerful. Now let's talk about your role changing kind of the perceptions about young Arab Muslim women. Um, and I know you're studying in the United States. So what's been your experience? Uh, it's been an interesting year, just hearing so many different things from like my roommates or from my classmates, it's always- um, Surprised? As, yeah, surprised. Yeah. As soon as I start speaking, usually they're like, oh, you have a cute accent, but also it's like, <laughs> oh, um, you know how to speak English or you're taking engineering, like you're taking harder classes. Did you have to like take English courses before coming here? Like things like that. But also sometimes facing racism in the class or sexism by people thinking that I'm not capable of doing certain things um, in my engineering classes, which is sad, but I'm very happy to debunk all of these different things that people think about Arab women and especially Muslim women. Um, many think I live in the desert, which I do, but a very modern desert. <laughs> but also they think I don't have access to education and I tell them, you know, if I didn't have access to education, I wouldn't be in the same class you're in. So I think I'm very happy that I could answer so many questions but at the same time it's just like it's surprising that people still think that way and you know I think it's my role to give them that perspective and tell them this is my experience and it could apply to so many girls in the Middle East. So I, 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 and I tell my kids that time and also we have a team in Cairo and in, in the United States and I always tell 
my team, we are like ambassadors, right? So, you know, for a lot of people I interact with in, in the United States, they've never been to the Middle East or they've never really met an Egyptian woman or an Egyptian young girl, or even for my son, you know, an Egyptian young boy. And I tell them all the time that they need to be ambassadors for, some, you know, the, the, you know, because they're going to change people's perceptions. So I love that you're doing that. And I, and something you said really kind of resonated with me too. You know, even the racist comments are sometimes unintended, right? They just don't know any better. And I think the role we can play is to bridge that gap and kind of say, yes, I do live in a desert, but this is what it looks like. Or I, I remember being asked a lot of questions around like, what does your house look like? And I'm like, actually, it kind of looks like your house, right? <laughs> it's, not interesting. it's not that different. So um, I just take those questions with a lot of openness and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and take an angle that it's coming from a good place. I think that helps. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, so what kind of advice would you give young girls who are maybe interested in STEM, but don't really know how to get started? Um, I always try to tell people around me who are interested in STEM, and especially girls, is that you only need to take the first step, either watching a small YouTube video or reading an article online or checking someone's page who, like my page, for example, you know, looking at some experiences that could be your own so it's always about taking the first step I think for me it was it was the hardest part because I was so scared and, and I was worried how people would perceive me in my community and how it would be really hard for me to achieve what I wanted to achieve so if you're interested give it a try uh, try watching a video or two see if this is something you want to do and if not you can move on if yes then you found something that you're passionate in and maybe it could be your career in the future just like I did um, I also thought that I needed to have access to um, all of these technical courses and I had to pay huge amounts of money to have access to these great teachers. But then I realized that I have access to the Internet, which is a great resource. Um, mm -hmm. I learned so many things from the Internet. I learned how to code from the Internet. So if you have access to the Internet, uh, you'll be able to learn the basic skills and you don't really need to have access to all these expensive things or tools until you're ready for it. So. I always encourage girls to take that first step and of course, believe in yourself. Take the first step and believe in yourself. Can we talk a little bit about the role of the network? Like it, it struck me that you went to all these science fairs and tech fairs. Um, what role did that play for you? I mean, all of these events are great opportunities to meet other like-minded people and also to connect with great minds and pioneers in the field. Um, I'm always happy to join either as a participant or as a speaker. So I feel like it's an honor every time. But growing up, I felt like these events were very discouraging because personally for me, because the way they like pick the winners or, mm -hmm. you know, you voted for the best creation was based on certain points that were created by, you know, didn't necessarily target the goal of serving the community, but rather, you know, technical skill and other things that, beginners don't really have. Um, so I think there were great learning opportunities for me and for many people, but sometimes it could be very discouraging. So I usually recommend that, you know, take your time with building so many things, but also try to give them a try because they could be something you're really good at, I mean, you know, gaining all the points and doing all of that. Yeah, I, 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 I always kind of encourage kind of our young um, team members and, and other people I work with, the power of the network can also be in just getting to know people in your community mm -hmm. and opening up opportunities that maybe you weren't aware of, right? Yeah, I think having access to so many great minds is very helpful in the sense of you need advice, if you need mentoring, but also if one day you need a recommendation letter or you you want to do an interview with someone great and you, you know, reach out to someone, you know, so I think networking plays a really big role. And as I mentioned in the last session, it sometimes brings you forward in what you want to achieve. Um, so I think, yeah, you, you should always reconnect with the people that you see and make sure you connect with people that could really benefit your career. Yeah, it took me a long number of years to learn that lesson because, you know, like you, I, I worked very hard as a kid and I just thought the solution to everything was just working harder and harder and harder. Mm -hmm. But I also think like making time to be part of a community and, um, 
engaging with, you know, peers and mentors and advisors is, is really is really important. Um, so we're going to start wrapping up. Um, mm -hmm. So who is your role model? Uh, this certain question, I'm not a I'm not personally a big fan of because I don't have a certain role model and I always confuse the people that I'm talking to, but it's usually, I'm always inspired by so many things around me, um, not certain personalities because the way I see role models is not wanting to be exactly like someone else. It's more of wanting to be inspired by certain parts of their experience and implementing it into your own life. I've had so many great minds that I connected with here in the UAE and also internationally, getting to know their experience, the struggles that they went through. Um, so yeah, I don't have a certain person in mind. It's usually, I'm very happy to like learn something from every person that I meet. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So then a related follow on question is, do you have a number of like core values or, you know, things that you really care about that drive you? I mean, definitely helping people. I realize it's something that I'm really passionate about, mm -hmm. but also, you know, being an influential part of my community. My community has been very supportive, uh, either on like a small level, but also as a governmental level, my country is very supportive. So I want to give back and I want to help people. And my way of doing that is representing my country well internationally, but also creating these different inventions that could help people around me. That's amazing. Okay, last question. Uh, what is next for you? So hopefully I'm planning to finish college and I want to pursue my PhD in AI. I really want to be a professor. <laughs> but, but also I want to start a company like yours. I want to work in AI and inspire other girls to, you know, start their own career and create some representation in the field. That is amazing. We definitely need more women and more diversity mm -hmm. in the field of AI. I mean, I um, I'm not gonna go go on my soapbox right now, but <laughs> I still believe that the only way we build technology that works for all of us is that we have to have diverse brains around the table. And mm -hmm. you are, I mean, we couldn't wish for a better ambassador and a better mm -hmm. innovator uh, to be part of this. So it has been my absolute pleasure interviewing you today. Um, you are such a rock star and um, good luck. Good luck with what's next. Thank you so much. The pleasure was mine. And thank you, Jenna, for inviting me. Thank you to both of you. Um, this was absolutely wonderful. And it was so nice to hear both of you speak about how we can use technology and innovation to push forward not only girls education, but uh, women in general worldwide. And so really thank you. And I can't wait to see what both of you do.